welcome to all of you to uh, the AIOC 2022. On behalf of being a Mumbaikar, I wish all of you a very good conference. So we're happy to be here and uh, we'll just introduce ourselves. I'm Dr. Nishita Agarwala. I am at the Hinduja Hospital. Yeah, I'm Dr. Radhakrishnan. I'm from uh, D.Y. Patel Medical College, Pune. I'm Dr. Mandar Paranspe. I'm from Pune and run a private practice. One announcement that if you all are, any of you all are members of the uh, Maharashtra Medical Council, please remember to add your registration numbers. Otherwise, you will not get your MMC points. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start this really quick. We want to stick to time because the previous uh, um, session has gone a little bit over. Uh, we will restrict the discussion to a personal discussion a little later on. And uh, may I ask uh, Dr. Isha Gupta to come and present her work? So she doesn't get marked. I'll request all the speakers to, you know, limit yourselves to six minutes so that we don't, uh, you know, overrun. We're already running 10 minutes late. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. The title for my presentation is Assessment of Quality of Vision and Scheinflug Analysis After Deep Anterior Lamellar Keratoplasty. I have no financial interests. Penetrating keratoplasty has been the treatment of choice for corneal diseases in the past. However, lately, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty has gained popularity as an alternative for diseases that affect the corneal stroma and uh, do not affect the endothelium or Desmet's membrane. DALC has various advantages over PK like reduced graft rejection and failure rates, decreased need for post-operative immunosuppressive agents, faster visual rehabilitation and longer graft survival. However, it is time consuming and technically challenging. Various studies in the past have compared the two procedures and have found comparable visual outcomes. The possible factors that can affect the visual quality after DALC are the graft host interface morphology like light scatter, interface haze and increased density. Uh, other factors are higher order abrasions and the residual stromal bed thickness. So analysis of these factors can help in quantifying the optical properties after the selective ramular keratoplasty. The aim and objective of our study was to analyze factors affecting quality of vision after DALC. It was a prospective interventional study done for a duration of one year and 25 eyes were assessed. It was conducted in patients attending cornea clinic and OPD of Guru Nanak Eye Center with diseases affecting stroma and sparing the endothelium. The post-operative evaluation was done for corneal abrasions, including both higher order and lower order abrasions, and corneal densitometry, which was performed using Scheinflug imaging at six months. Also, ASOCT was done to assess the graft host morphology. Lastly, correlation analysis was done of co corneal abrasions and densitometry with the post-operative best corrected visual acuity. Patients with age more than seven years and diseases, uh, corneal stromal diseases were included in the study and patients with gross posterior segment pathology or any ocular comorbidity and pregnant lactating females were excluded. The post-operative evaluation was done on day one, four, day seven, 14, one month, two months, three months, four months and six months. At all visits, the uh, best corrected visual acuity, graft clarity, graft host apposition and suture status were assessed, whereas the ASOCT and Scheinflug analysis were done at four and six months. The primary outcome assessed was best spectacle corrected visual acuity at six months, whereas the secondary outcomes were lenticule and host thickness and corneal densitometry and HOAs from anterior and posterior corneal surface. The surgery was performed under local anesthesia or uh, preferably under general anesthesia after taking the corneal measurement. The uh, partial thickness definition was done which was deepened followed by debulking of the cornea and then uh, an attempt of big bubble formation was done. Following the bubble formation, the uh, re remaining stroma was removed and this was followed by suturing of the ho graft host uh, with 16 interrupted sutures. The result analysis included patients from age 10 to 56 years. 60% of the patients were females and 40% males. The most common indication was keratoconus whereas other indications for surgery were granular dystrophy, healed in infective keratitis, keloid, lattice dystrophy, etc. In 68% of the patients, type 1 bubble formed whereas in remaining patients, layer-by-layer layer dissection was done, and in only one patient, type 2 bubble formed. 
the mean BCVA improved from 1.35 logmar units to 0.36 logmar units at six months, which was significant with a p-value of less than 0.001. The corneal abrasion analysis at six months was done and it was found that uh, corneal abrasions from front cornea from posterior surface as well as total abrasions were higher. Similarly, corneal densitometric analysis was done and the densitometry was also found to be higher. The post-op spherical equivalent was mean was minus two diopters and the mean residual stromal bed thickness was 38 microns with a range of 10 to 80 microns. Correlation analysis of BCVA with various parameters was done and it was found to significantly correlate with post-operative residual stromal bed thickness, the total corneal higher order abrasions, the higher order abrasions from front cornea, the total corneal lower order abrasions and the posterior corneal densitometry. These are the clinical photographs of a patient with keratoconus uh, for which DALC was done, the pre-operative photographs and the post-operative day one photograph showing a well a post graft with 16 intact sutures and the post-op six month photo with a clear graft and all sutures removed. These are the corneal densitometry photo and the post-operative ASOCT done at six months showing a well centered attached graft with a residual stromal bed of 23 microns. These are some of the more clinical photos of patients with granular corneal dystrophy, Salzman nodular keratopathy and lattice dystrophy uh, which show a clear attached graft. So we concluded in our study that there was a significant improvement in the post-operative BCV at six months. There was significant correlation of post-operative best corrected visual acuity with the anterior and total corneal higher order abrasions and the total corneal lower order abrasions and an inverse correlation of posterior corneal densitometry in 0 to 2 mm zone with the BCVA. So abrasions and densitometry have a negative impact on the BCVA. The residual stromal bed thickness also has an inverse correlation with BCVA. Uh, that is lesser the stromal bed thickness, better is the visual acuity. When we compared the two groups of type 1 bubble DALC and uh, layer by layer dissection, there was a trend towards better post-op vision and lesser thickness uh, and lower operations and densitometry in the type 1 bubble group. However, the difference was not significant because of lesser number of cases in the layer by layer dissection group. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for completing your talk in six minutes. Good morning. Good morning one and all, I am Pinkal Shiroya and the topic which I am going to discuss is long term outcome of the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty in pediatric keratoconus. Pediatric keratoconus is aggressive and rapidly progressive in nature and the keratoplasty in pediatric keratoconus is always challenging because of uh, lower scleral rigidity, general anesthesia, early suture related problems, graft rejection due to stronger immune system of the children. The most preferred procedure was deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. The lacuna in our literature is limited number of subjects, includes wide range of the age group and outcome includes several other indications, not specifically keratoconus. The aim of my study to analyze the long term outcome of deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty in pediatric keratoconus. Uh, it is a retrospective study of all the keratoconus patients less than 18 years in uh, attending the cornea clinic Arvindai Hospital, Coimbatore, in a time span of February 2008 to December 2019. All the patients underwent pre-op evaluation. They underwent slit lamp examination, visual acuity and refraction and topography. The surgical technique which was used was big bubble technique. 0.2 mm oversized button was sutured with tenor nylon. And as a post-op regimen, topical prednisolone was used in tapering dose and was later shifted to low dose uh, steroids or cyclosporin. This is how we are going to look at, at our results. 221 eyes of 185 patients underwent DALC. The age group was 6 to 18 years. In our study, 71% that is pre male predominance was seen more and uh, left eye was operated mo uh, was more. The mean follow-up period was 6 to 130 months. The most common comorbidity associated in our study was vernal keratoconjunctivitis. 39.3% patient had. Corneal op uh, apical scars were found in 6.65% of the patient. Deep scars in ASOCT was found in 1.3% of the patient. 
on comparing the visual outcome, the mean uncorrected visual acuity was Im significantly improved by 0.51 uh, logma unit and best corrected visual acuity was improved by, uh, by 0.48 logma unit. Coming to refraction, Spherical component showed tremendous improvement of uh, 5.37 diopter and cylindrical component showed a tremendous improvement of 2.38 diopter. Uh, the similar, the similar uh, improvement was seen in the keratometry reading. Kmax was improved by 9.56 diopter and SIMK was improved by 3.35. 80% of uh, patients in our study has visual outcome better than 6 by 12. If we compare with the other study, Aurora et al. showed 45% of the improvement, Patel et al. showed 86% of the improvement, and Fizi et al. showed 84% of the improvement. Uh, big bubble was successfully achieved in 66% of the patient, and in those patients where we could not achieve big bubble, either they were uh, hydro dissection was done to the patient or manual dissection. If we compare the success of big bubble with other studies, Fizi et al. showed 75%. Uh, Nuxan et al. showed 77% uh, and Aurora et al. showed 80%. But all these three studies included uh, adult patients as well. The most common interop complication was DM perforation. 15.39% patient had DM perforation. 20 patients with DM perforation had double AC and they were treated with rebubbling. The first most post-op uh, complication uh, which we came across was uh, glaucoma. 14.9% of the patient had glaucoma. 30 patients were treated with anti-glaucoma medication. Two patients were treated with laser trabeculoplasty and one patient was treated with TRAP. Second uh, complication uh, which we came across was cataract. 5.7% of the patient had cataract. The commonest type of cataract was uh, posterior subcapsular cataract. And five patients who underwent rebubbling had cataract as their post-op complication. The third uh, post of complication was delayed epithelial healing, which was found in 70% of the patient, and 2% of the patient had non-leaning ED, which was being treated with Botox injection. On coming to the suture-related uh, complications, suture, uh, 49 cases were had suture replacement in and around three months. Suture removal was initiated uh, at around seven months and was completed by 29 months. Coming to the graft-related complication, 13.12% of the patient had vascularization, including superficial and deep. 9.5% of the patient had graft infection. The most commonest organism was streptococcus pneumonia. 6.67% of the patient had graft rejection, and it was treated with topical steroids. Uh, now, among the 221 eyes, the fellow eye management protocol were 48.87% uh, of the patient uh, underwent C3R, 10.86% of the patient underwent DAL, and 2.71% uh, of the patient underwent PKP. If we compare the VKC and non-VKC group, uh, they were, uh, we found that delayed epithelial healing, suture-related complication, and graft rejections were found more in the VKC-associated uh, patients. These are the review of my literature. And at the end, I would like to conclude my study. The DALC is the most effective technique for the pediatric keratoconus with good visual recovery and uh, graft survival. DALC can be associated with unique complications like DM perforation and double anterior chamber. And vernal keratoconjunctivitis needs to be addressed to avoid the complications in the pediatric keratoconus. These are my references. Uh, thank you. Are there any studies you know, which compare your DALC with uh, penetrating keratoplasty in children? Uh, Showed, uh, but it included, it included adult patients as well. It was not specifically related to the pediatric keratoconus. Were these, sorry, I'm sorry. Were these uh, children given an option of C3R before doing uh, DALC? Sir, we included those patients which had a uh, steep cornea, which were not being uh, eligible for the C3R criteria, like steep cornea and whose uh, ker keratometric readings were high and whose uh, contact lens intolerance patient, whose after C3R, we could not find the improvement of the contact lens. So some of them were post C3R? No, sir. No, none no, of them were no, post no, C3R? No, sir. How many of them with a DM perforation had to undergo a penetrating keratoplasty? Or sir, 2.27% of the patient underwent. And rebubbling was done with SF6? S or? Air, sir, ma'am. Sorry? Air, ma'am. Only air. Only okay. Air. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Surbi, Dr. Surbi Benival, yeah, can you come and please present your work? You 
can start, Susie. You can start. Let's round it off. Up in Jalli, 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 to Pata Pata Ho Jalli. everybody uh, the title of my study was artificial intelligence in the diagnosis of corneal ectasia uh, keratoconus hmm? is a degenerative and progressive non vascular corneal disease which leads to thinning of the central cornea resulting in irregular astigmatism and decreased vision diagnostic challenges posed by the hmm. ffkc and early kc cases because these patients show no symptoms and there are no detectable signs seen on routine examination and in the past few decades with the emergence and popularity of corneal refractive surgeries it has become even more important to diagnose these asymptomatic cases because operating on these cases would lead to iatrogenic ectasia so corneal topographic maps comprise of meticulous amount of detail where subjective evaluation becomes a task and there has been a common consensus that pentacam which uses the skymflux system has turned out to be a novel diagnostic tool in diagnosing corneal ectasia so uh, several artificial intelligence technologies have attempted to interpret these topographic maps and scientists have developed several machine learning models wherein large amount of data is analyzed very conveniently and feature selection is performed to identify both best performing model and a subset of most promising corneal parameters in detecting both preclinical and clinical kc with high accuracy so we conducted a prospective cross sectional comparative study wherein 75 eyes were studied and the inclusion criteria was patients about 12 years of age with corrected visual acuity of less than or equal to 6 by 6 presenting with complaints of shadowing or ghosting of images frequent squinting squeezing of eyes to see frequent change in spectacle cylindrical par and axis presence of irregular cornea determined by scissoring reflex on retinoscopy by microscopic signs of kc history of kc in the other eye medical history of atopy and family history of keratoconus the basic preliminary examination was conducted after asking the patients to discontinue contact lens and corneal topography was performed using pentacam hr the thinnest packy value and the bad d score the version 3 of the bad d score was computed on a spreadsheet the cornea is were finally divided into two groups group 1 comprised of 67 eyes with ffkc which had a bad d score between 0 to 1.6 and group 2 comprised of 8 eyes with kc of moderate form with a bad d score between 1.6 and 3 uh, briefly about the machine learning classifier wherein 500 patients were recruited to develop the classifier and two 4 and 6 mm circles were taken on the total corneal refractive power map and 360 data points were acquired from the center to the periphery and the maximum diopteric power at these circles was marked as k1 and similar point exactly opposite was marked as k2 and the difference between these two was computed similarly the minimum k1 and k1 values were computed a decision tree classifier was used for classification of the data and 1.4 was found out to be the cut off value for the k1 minus k2 value during the initial phase we trained the tree on 70% of the data and tested the tree on 30% of the data and a second validation step was an independent step wherein 75 eyes of either clinically or topographically proven cases of corneal ectasia were tested uh, coming to the results uh, based on the receiver operating curve uh, it can be seen that the maximum uh, k1 minus k2 of 2 and 4 mm circles was shown to have the uh, maximum significance and area under the curve of the trc tcrp map also showed similar results there was no single tcrp index which was completely diagnostic of corneal ectasia as the algorithm in a step wise manner analyzed the maximum k1 minus k2 followed by minimum k1 minus k2 in the 4 and 2 mm circles and any value which was greater than or equal to 1.4 was taken and the analysis was stopped at this cut off point uh, coming to the discussion Uh, several studies in the past have been conducted wherein anterior and posterior corneal curvature along with the corneal thickness has been taken into consideration to differentiate between keratoconus and uh, early keratoconus cases in our study we have taken tcrp as the most reliable parameter in diagnosing corneal ectasia 
Using the ray tracing technology, the incoming parallel rays are traced through the anterior and posterior corneal surfaces and the measured focal length is converted into the corneal path. A wide variability in sensitivity and specificity of the K1 minus K2 value in diagnosing corneal ectasia was noticed in our study and this could be due to the individual biochemical variation in each eye. Keeping this finding in view, the overall sensitivity of the classifier was 91% and it was 100% specific. The positive predictive value of the algorithm was 100% and the negative predictive value was 50%. Our algorithm was 92% accurate in diagnosing corneal ectasia. With this analysis, it can be said that our algorithm did not over-diagnose any of the tested eyes. The ectatic eyes were correctly classified as FFKC and KC eyes in accordance with their diagnosis based on the BAD-D score. When we analyzed our training set, the accuracy was 99%, but upon testing, the uh, set accuracy reduced to 92%. The eyes tested were already diagnosed based on BAD-D score into FFKC and KC, and this could have been the confounding factor. Uh, there were uh, six outlier cases in our study wherein... Can you conclude, please? I think uh, running short of time, you know. Yeah. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we have described a machine learning classifier which considers topographic data, that is the TCRP for the diagnosis of corneal ectasia, which is a derivative of cor corneal anterior elevation, posterior elevation and corneal thickness, and it is not influenced by any of these parameters individually. It is advisable to explore the avenue for application of machine learning algorithms and neural networks in assisting identification of ectitic or susceptible corneas. This can aid in extending tertiary level cornea care at primary care centers. Please so can we just give us the take home message from the whole study? So the thing is Pantacam requires a lot of high uh, level understanding of the maps. So what algorithm we have developed is it just uses one value that is 1.4. So any reading which is 1.4 or more really, uh, like, uh, can roughly tell that maybe this cornea is ectatic or into the preclinical uh, uh, ectasia case. So this is basically for the primary uh, center you said? Yes, sir. So do you think a primary center will have a shrimp like? Uh, so that will not be, that we just need, need the data, so that's it. No, but then you need the shrimp like, no, for it? No? So you think a primary care center will have a shrimp like? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Sri Devi Nair. Dr. Badpur. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I will be presenting our study of shine plug analysis of corneal haze following different collagen cross-linking technique done for progressive keratoconus, where we compared standard epithelium of contact lens assisted and transepithelial cross-linking technique. There is no financial interest in our study. As we all know that corneal cross-linking is an most commonly practiced and, and established treatment to stabilize progressive keratoconus. And post operative corneal haze is most commonly uh, observed in up to 90% of eyes in varying degrees, which can be graded on slit lamp but is very subjective. So Scheinflug densitometer is available that allows objective quantification of corneal haze. In our study, we utilize this modality to evaluate changes in corneal haze after CXL over 12 months duration period and compare its scores with different techniques. In literature, standard epithelium of and transepithelium have already been described, but contact lens assisted corneal haze has not been described. This was a retrospective study done in our centers uh, where patients undergoing CXL with complete data up to one year were recruited and corneal haze was measured on pentacam done preoperatively and post operatively at one month, three months, six months and 12 months duration. Sample size included 95 eyes of 85 patients and we uh, included patients with corneal thickness more than 350 micron and uh, standard CXL was done for the eyes with corneal thickness more than 450 micron and in 350 to 450 micron CSCXL and transepithelial CXL was preferred. Briefly describing our surgical technique, standard epi off was done according in accordance to Dresden protocol involving central epithelial debridement and loading phase and UV radiation phase each of 30 minutes. Contact lens assisted was basically same uh, with 
exception of UV radiation phase where riboflavin soap contact lens was applied to increase the effective corneal, lens thickne uh, corneal thickness. Whereas in transepithelial uh, CXL, no epithelial debridement was done and rest was same. And the corneal op densitometry was uh, done using the inbuilt software available on the Pentacam where it measures the corneal densitometry values in grayscale units in anterior, central and the posterior layer in different annuli done around the apex. So in our study, uh, the baseline visual acuity and the MRSC was comparable, whereas in transepithelial and contact lens assisted group, tachymetry was thinner and it was more advanced. Baseline densitometry in all three groups was comparable in all the layers. So post CXCL, uh, what we observe that in standard CXL, there was a maximum change in the corneal haze, which peaked at around three months and slowly declined over 12 months but was still more than that of the baseline but was not significant statistically. Whereas in contact lens epithelial group and trans epithelial group there was only a slight raise in corneal haze but that was not st uh, significant statistically. In CACXL group it uh, was same from one to six months and then declined uh, from six to 12 months whereas in trans epithelial group it declined after one month and remain lower than the baseline. Similar pattern was seen in all the layers, maximum in anterior layer and minimum in the posterior most layer. Comparing the different annuli, it was seen that there was a maximum increase in haze in the central 2mm area in all three groups in all the layers and in central area even at 12 months that haze was significantly higher than that of the baseline in standard CXL group but not in the other two groups. Similar relation was seen in all the layers. Comparing the visual and the topographic outcomes, it was observed that there was a similar comparable amount of improvement in the visual acuity in three groups and the amount of flattening also uh, observed was comparable in three groups. Safety wise and progression wise, the similar, uh, all three groups were comparable. So it was seen that all three techniques appear to be equally efficacious and correlation analysis was done uh, correlating densimetry score with visual acuity, keratometry and change in keratometry at 12 months. But this, there was no correlation was found. So it suggested that corneal haze may just be an associated with CXL induced biomechanical changes in wound healing process but not the extent of CXL induced stiffening. So we concluded that all three procedures are efficacious with less haze development in contact lens assisted and trans epithelial cross-linking technique. Corneal haze may not be predictive of the treatment outcome and there was no correlation, correlation with visual acuity observed. Therefore, CACXL and trans epithelial CXL could be an acceptable alternative to standard CXL method, especially for thin cornea with equivalent efficacy, safety, minimal corneal haze and early recovery. So you did say that the corneal haze was less at the end of your study period yes. in standard CXL. Uh, ma'am, as compared to all the three groups. Ah, sorry, it was more. It was yes, ma'am. Yeah. So there so was some persistent haze was still there in standard CXL group, but not in the other two groups. So would that affect the visual acuity? No, ma'am. Would you be concerned about uh, then moving to another modality of doing the CXL? since uh, the haze is uh, more with standard? Yes, ma'am. Because no we all of us prefer to do standard other than the other. In pediatric hmm. children, we still prefer to, but hmm. no correlation with visual acuity was seen. But in especially in thin corneas where standard CXL cannot be done because of the uh, endothelial uh, uh, degeneration uh, risk of it. So trans epithelial CXL could be a good alternative without any without affecting their impact on effectiveness. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Barkha. Oh, you're Barkha, sorry, sorry. Anjana. Anjana, is here?
Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Bhavya. I'll be presenting our work on redefining ocular pain in confocal with confocal and molecular signatures. There are no financial disclosures. So uh, when we look at the patient profile that walk into our clinics, there are, pay there are those who do not complain of uh, any ocular surface discomfort and they do not have any clinical signs of triad disease as well. And there are those who don't actively complain of ocular surface pain, but when we examine them, we may see some signs of dry eye disease in them. And then, then those who actively complain of ocular surface pain, discomfort, and their signs correlate with their severity of the symptoms, and we can treat them easily with the conventional dry eye ma uh, disease management. But then comes our most troubling cohort, or those who have very high ocular surface discomfort uh, or a chronic refractory symptoms, but when we examine them, we may not find the clinical signs that correlate with the severity of the symptoms. So then we, th we wanted to understand what are the pathomechanisms behind this troubling ocular surface pain in these patients. And, we wa and with this knowledge, we wanted to develop an algorithmic approach to manage them. So what we thought was the relevant mechanisms, pathomechanisms behind this ocular surface pain was ocular surface inflammation, which we tried to study through the, uh, through the corneal dendritic cell density with confocal microscopy and tear soluble inflammatory cytokines, as well as dysregulated ocular surface nociception, again, by anal analyzing the tear soluble nociceptive factors, and then looking at the neuropathy component through the presence or absence of microneuromas through confocal imaging. So we tried to establish a novel algorithmic approach in manage of management of patients with ocular surface pain. We considered clinical factors like OSD, uh, OSDI score and TFM instability, as well as confocal microscopy features and tear soluble factors. So this is our uh, novel classification system, which we, I have de uh, described earlier, which we call discomfort concordance staging, where we give emphasis to the discordance between the patient signs and symptoms and the uh, chronicity, the refractiveness of the symptoms, whether these symptoms correlate well enough with the clinical signs the clinician can examine on the slit lamp. So we included patients with uh, primary symptom of ocular surface pain or discomfort. Our controls did not have any clinically delineable signs of dry eye disease or neither did they, have, did they have symptoms. We excluded patients with aqueous uh, deficiency dry eye and other confounding variables. So we did a uh, tear, co tear collection and soluble factor profiling with our in-house molecular lab. And we also uh, collected the clinical factors, including ocular surface dis disease index, as well as TS, uh, TFM stability was measured through tear breakup time testing. The confocal micro microscopy gives excellent uh, cross-sectional images of all the layers of the cornea. So we, on confocal microscopy, we studied the dendritic cell density, both mature and immature, the subbasal nerve plexus features, as well as presence or absence of microneuromas. So what we found was interesting. There was an increase in corneal dendritic cell density with the increasing uh, OSDI score. Similarly, in those troubling, in those fourth subset of patients who had discordant be discordance between, the, between their signs and symptoms, actually had higher uh, dendritic cell density compared to the other groups. In these patients, a higher proportion of these patients with discordance of their signs and symptoms had microneuromas compared to the other groups of patients. And another interesting uh, uh, finding in our study is when we assess their tear factors, there was a there was a imbalance between the pro nociceptive factors as well as the anti nociceptive factors. These patients had dysregulated nociception and they had higher uh, pro nociceptive factors like interleukin 17A. So uh, we believe that we could give the answers to the, uh, to this troubling question like why does my patient has this ocular surface pain? And they may be having higher corneal dendritic cell density, higher microneuromas, and altered ocular surface nociception. And we brought out these results in a single cohort, and we tested the tear molecular factors, the confocal microscopy, and the clinical factors, uh, clinical factors in a single cohort. What we know is these, all these features were previously studied, but they were studied in different, different cohorts. And we brought them all in, a, in one uh, in subject cohort. And we also try to give a molecular target for future therapies, which is interleukin 17A. And we also give a novel algorithmic approach where we, sh where we show you that if, there if you find a discordance between the clinical signs of dry eye disease and ocular dry eye disease and the uh, patient's symptoms, try to look beyond the, dry, the traditional tests of dry eye disease, look for subclinical ocular surf surface inflammation through confocal microscopy, 
think there might be some level of dysregulated ocular surface nociception and also look for uh, think of neuropathic pain component maybe it is better to involve a neurologist in your treatment paradigm and uh, this and in future we are looking for a in, uh, possible targeted therapies for these patients together we can help these patients in a better way than did the existing uh, management plan so this is our first uh, ophthalmic lab on chip which we are trying to uh, include in our uh, day-to-day -day practice to which also helps in the TM molecular factor analysis in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So you mean to say that people who are having symptoms with no signs, they really are in trouble? Yes, sir. Uh, we, even though we may not be able to see them through a traditional dry eye test, they may be having some subclinical inflammation which is better delineable with confocal microscopy features and also the tear soluble factors. That's the reason why I included the last slide. So we don't have it available right now. We cannot test for uh, altered nociception, which we keep talking about. Like these patients may be having altered nociception, their nociceptive pathways may be different from the other dry eye patients, but these are all conjectures. So we are trying to bring that out. I showed you interleukin 17A, but there are other nociceptive factors as well. So if we can study them in our clinics, or not for all patients, only those subset, selected subset of patients with chronic ocular surface pain, which we are not able to treat them effectively. Maybe we can bring out. Yeah, so any recommendations for their management? Sir, uh, one is if you look, if you find microneuromas in these patients, think of neuropathic pain. As I told, involve a neurologist and uh, use tricyclic antidepressants in these patients, apart from the, dry, the regular dry eye management. And also autologous serum may be helpful in these patients because it has pro it has anti nociceptive factors and, and anti inflammatory factors as well but only in selective patients mm, are these microneuromas uh, the reason for uh, the pain or are they a consequence of the inflammatory process yes sir uh, so that is uh, we cannot we cannot decisively establish it because it is a vicious cycle so when there is an ocular surface inflammation which is evident with the uh, increased dendritic cells and all that changes the nerve uh, that that inflammation the nerves actually respond to that inflammation with the through the formation of this microneuromas or there could be a primary uh, neuropathic component as well without a, a coexisting ocular surface inflammation also so it could be both cause and effect. There is the MMP9 uh, strip already available. Does that correlate yes, any uh, with any with of this, this uh, uh, work? Yes. Uh, we have an uh, other work parallel going on with the uh, kit we have shown you. We are yes. testing eight analytes. Okay. So right now we haven't done a correlation between that, but we also have an MMP9 in our kit as well. Okay. So we are looking Since at that's easily available. Does that help us in any way? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have to establish, yes, MMP9 has, that kit has been established for dry disease management. Yes, I'm aware of that, but uh, it's not just the MMP9. MMP9 is a pro-inflammatory factor, but it also helps in uh, wound repairing as well. It is a matrix medulloproteinase. So we're also looking at other uh, pro-inflammatory factors. If you see uh, the slide, uh, we have interleukin-1, interleukin-6. These are more important primary pro-inflammatory factors. So they may be having more important role in dry disease than MMP9. We don't know unless we look for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Huh. Huh? Yeah, Anjana, madam. Huh. Mr. Karsakwin. Yeah, can we have Dr. Anjana? No, no, no. She's finished. It's Sri Devi no. Nair, I think. Sri Devi Nair, na? No? Sri. Yeah. yeah. Sri Devi Nair. Anjana is not finished. No? no, she's not finished. She's not finished. She's not finished. She was the one which uh, you should not come, no, ma'am. Yeah, come. Ah, Anjana, ah, come. Ah, okay. She came and then she had to come. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this lady is not there. Sri Devi. Hmm. She's not come. Is Dr. Sri Devi Nair here? Good morning. At the onset, I thank AIS for giving me an opportunity to present my work. Uh, it's on spectral domain optical coherence tomography for imaging palisades of worked in normal and in disease. It is a small case series. As you know, corneal scler scleral limpus, it 
comprises of epithelium and stroma and palisades of wart are uh, housed in this area. They have electron dense uh, basal cells called the stem cells and the stroma has connective tissue with vasculature and lymph lymphatics. Palisades of Vogue's are the radial infolding at the corneoscleral junction. It's very unique. There is a term called congenital glyphics or lymphoglyphics to uh, show the pattern of palisades of Vogue in different person. It's uh, individual hallmark. And uh, what I have done is study the palisades of Vogue. This has been uh, uh, mentioned in literature. Optical coherence tomography as a rapid and accurate non-contact method for visualizing palisades of work was done by Lathorp et al. They found that anatomical characteristics can be clearly imaged uh, with OCT. And high resolution OCT was done to study limbal stem cell deficiency by Shobit Varma et al. And uh, in vivo volumetric imaging of human corneoscleral limbus with spectral domain OCT was done by Biseva et al. In Biseva et al. study, they used a research grade OCT and a volumetric analysis of the stem cell was done and uh, extensive study of the palisades of work was done. What I have done was, I have imaged the uh, superior and inferior corneoscleral limbus with spectral domain OCT. Five normal subjects, five females and five males were taken. Five cases was taken and uh, the anatomy of palisades of work was imaged. So this is a normal image of palisades of work. What you can see, uh, which is uh, shown in star, are the palisades of work and the uh, horizontal line depicts the interpalisade distance. Uh, which was measured and the mean value was taken. The palisades of vote because of the presence of melanin pigment causes shadowing uh, which is seen uh, by the arrow. So quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis was done. Superior and inferior limbus was divided into three zones. Mean palisade rich height of three zones was calculated. Mean interpalisade epithelial retipic distance was calculated. These are the three zones as, uh, desire, uh, as uh, taken for the analysis. So the mean value correlated between uh, both inferior and superior limpus. Uh, the mean value of superior limpus was uh, in zone A was 80.90, zone B was 83.90 and zone C 81. In the inferior limpus it was 93.50, 82. Uh, 0 0.20 in zone B and 81.970 as is described in anatomy inferior palisades of vote are thicker as compared to the superior palisades of vote. The interpalisade distance also uh, was uh, comparable. It was a uh, mean value of 81 in zone A, uh, 73.40 in zone B, 76.80 in zone C in the superior limbus and in the inferior limbus it was 70.70, 85.10 and uh, 76.70 in zone C. So there were three anatomical patterns uh, seen in the normal individuals. Uh, this is the standard pattern where we can see cylindrical palisades of vote uh, which are non-confluent. And in lightly pigmented individual, we could obtain the uh, attenuated pattern that has rounded dome-like palisades of vote with increased interpalisade distance. It was seen in three of the normal individuals. And in heavily, uh, in darkly pigmented individuals, exaggerated pattern was seen. There was confluence of the palisades of vote and a continuum was seen uh, extending uh, in the palisades of vote area. Coming on to diseased individual, this is an already associated limbal stem cell deficiency. There is a absence of palisades of vote, but shadowing can be seen uh, in the uh, OCD. In post keratoplasty LSCD, we can see absence of palisades of vote also increased uh, vasculature in the uh, corneoscleral limbus. In uh, contact lens wearer, we can see diminished uh, visibility of palisades of vote. It may show an uh, early uh, limbal stem cell deficiency developing. In uh, inferior panis, there is loss of palisades of vote with increased vasculature. In mixed etiology dry eye, there is decreased uh, shadowing of palisades of work with increased uh, vasculature which is seen. So in conclusion, spectral domain OCT is uh, able to visualize the structure of limpel palisades of work and microvasculature of healthy human limbus without contact. 
it can be used as an investigative modality in harvesting limbal tissue for ocular surface reconstruction like SLET. Early loss of palisades of wolf can be studied non-invasively. Future uh, direction would be to collect a normative visa, uh, data on fast imaging of the vasculature to study the changes of the limbal vasculature, histopathological and immunofluorescence marking of the limbal tissue to identify the stem cell niche and characterization of palisades of wolf in various limbal stem cell disorders. These are my references. Thank you. What is the clinical importance of your study? We can know uh, from which area we have to harvest the uh, limbal stem cell if you are planning a surgical procedure. By non-contact procedure, we can image the palisades of oak. Wherever the palisades of oak are numerous, we can Im uh, correct, correct. But you are saying that if the pigmentation is, a, uh, you know, it becomes very difficult to pick up these palisades. Pigmentation is the causing the shadowing. Palisades of oak are visible as such. You are in able the to visualize uh, it. Okay. So have you uh, done any uh, correlation between your OCT and a morphological finding, the actual slit lamp yes. images in these patients? I have not compared with the slit lamp images because uh, this uh, we get the cross section. In slit lamp image, it's a photo. No, that's what I'm saying. So if, if you look at the OCT, it's fine. But can you, uh, if you can do a comparison between that and what you s actually see on the slit lamp, so that because everybody can't uh, get an OCT, OCT done. so. Yeah, that would be a future direction. Very interesting. But good to know that OCT is being used for so several uh, newer diagnostic uh, methods. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Abhilasha. She's there. And then the last one. Or they want it in pen? I don't know. They've given us pencils, so they want us. <laughs> oh, but then that's a problem. Everybody can change it tomorrow. <laughs> Possibly. Maybe that's a reason. <laughs> so they have already decided. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the topic for my presentation is repeat uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty for failed primary deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. As we all know, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty these days is the preferred surgical option over penetrating keratoplasties in those cases where the endothelial cell function is good. And uh, hence we have lower rates of endothelial cell loss, graft rejection and failure. Also fewer post-operative complications since it's an extraocular procedure, we do not enter the anterior chamber. And also many studies have concluded that the 10 years graft survival of primary DALC is superior to that of penetrating keratoplasty. The indications for DALC in Indian scenario include ectatic corneal disorders, most commonly keratoconus, which are account for 70% of cases of DALC being performed in India. Other indications include corneal scarring, corneal dystrophy, infective keratitis, ocular post-ocular surface reconstruction. The causes of failure of DALC uh, include interface haze deposits, vascularization, which account for the most common cause for failed DALCs. The other causes include stromal scarring, recurrence of primary disease, infection, rejection, melt, dub persistent anterior chamber, post-PRK haze. Uh, most of the study, uh, since the number, there's a rise in the number of cases being performed uh, for DALCs, so there is a rise in the number of failed DALCs, and hence we need a technique to address these cases of failed DALCs. Most of the studies, however, that have been done and reported, they report the results of repeat penetrating keratoplasty following failed DALCs in keratoconus eyes. There are also studies documenting the success of DALC after failed anterior lamellar keratoplasty, but however, there's a paucity of studies documenting the role of repeat DALC following primary failed DALCs done for varied etiologies. And to the best of our knowledge, there's just two studies published till date documenting the role of re-DALC in case of primary DALC. These are the two studies, one of them uh, published by Sefer Fiziatal in Cornea, uh, they documented uh, 12, the case of 12 eyes, uh, out of which 11 uh, cases of uh, failed primary DALCs underwent penetrating keratoplasty and only one re-DALC was done. Uh, in a study done by Vincent Sorzia et al, which was published in Cornea in 2015, re-DALC was performed in five eyes. Both the studies concluded uh, uh, to have an uh, excellent uh, re a prognosis for repeat keratoplasty. In our study, a retrospective analysis of failed DALC cases were done. Uh, seven patients were included and redals were performed two months to six years after the primary surgery. The follow-up period ranging from 1.5 to 4 years. 
The indications for primary DALK in our patients uh, included keratoconus with the VKC in two patients, corneal amyloidosis in two cases, uh, advanced keratoconus with heel hydrops with a central corneal scar with VKC in one case, and Salzman nodular keratopathy and interstitial keratitis in one case each. The causes of failure noted in our studies included interface haze with vascularization in three cases, recurrence of primary disease was found to be there in two cases, graft infection with a central deep scar and interface infection in one case each. A preoperative assessment uh, was done for all cases, which included uncorrected, best corrected visual acuity, slit lamp examination, IOP, corneal thickness, posterior segment assessment. ASOCT was done to determine the uh, donor as well as the residual stromal bed thickness. Now, the technique that was used in our study uh, was as follows. First, the host cornea was, mo uh, was measured. The donor lenticule of the primary graft was uh, quantified using caliper. The same size trephine was used to mark the ho host cornea. And uh, the trephination was done to a depth of 90%, following which the superior superficial stromal layers were removed and a pneumatic dissection with bi big bubble technique was performed in two cases. This figure this uh, is showing uh, the, the uh, pneumatic dissection with big, bu big bubble, which can be easily performed here following which the superficial rares are removed and uh, donor corneal lenticule is transplanted. In other, the remaining five cases, the anterior lenticule was just lifted off the bed, dissected and removed. The post-operated treatment included uh, antibiotics, steroids and lubricants. Suture removal was done after six months uh, in, for loose sutures and remaining suture removed after a stable follow-up period of one year. The follow-up in all cases ranged from 1.5 to 4 years. Uh, now the results of our study, the results have been summarized in uh, this table. As we can see, all the BSCVA preoperative in all cases was less than finger counting at 5 meter and the BSCVA postoperative was uh, better than uh, 6 by 12 in all cases except one where uh, the visual acuity was 6 by 60 since the patient had a central uh, heel hydrop scar. We would like to also conclude that there was no complication uh, encountered during resurgery or follow-up and at the most recent examination after a period of 18 months after secondary graft, all regrafts were clear and uh, post-operative refractive astigmatism averaged 2 to 4 diopter. Now I would like to discuss a few cases included in our study. This was a case of uh, keratoconus with VKC which at two years of follow-up developed interface opacification with cholesterol crystals as is evident in this figure. And uh, since the BSCV had dropped to finger counting at four meter, a redalc was performed. This is the imaged post-operative picture. This is the post-operative picture at 12 weeks. Uh, the patient had a best corrected visual acuity of 612 and a clear corneal graft, which is evident on the ASOCT image as well. Uh, can you conclude? We have running short of time, you know. So, uh, in conclusion, our uh, study had seven patients with failure of primary DALC done for varied etiologies, underwent uh, redalc, and were followed up over a period of 1.5 year, and we had a successful visual outcome in all patients, uh, and that was comparable to that of primary DALC. Also, we would like to emphasize that the dissection of host bed was easier in the second surgery owing to weaker adhesions, and hence repeat DALC should be preferred in all cases of failed DALC due to the ease of re repeatability, retaining the advantages of primary surgery. And also, as I mentioned, the, uh, there are weaker adhesions between the stroma and the decimates membrane, and the post-operative visual uh, recovery does not dis differ from that experience after primary DALC. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, AIOS for choosing this paper to be part of this wonderful session. Uh, it's a very simple paper about uh, a clinical conundrum which I faced while seeing these patients, and I just wanted to you know, share these results with you. So we'll be talking about how the, you know, what are the changes of rokinase inhibitor drops on uh, cases of Fuchs corneal dystrophy. So we all know that uh, this rho kinase is uh, a molecule which has been talked about quite a lot from Kinoshita's group and other groups after that who have used um, this in cases which have endothelial uh, issues. And basically the activated uh, rho A acts on rho kinase, divides it into the rho 1 and 2. And this works to phosphorylate various intracellular substances uh, in the corneal endothelium. 
and it has various actions. So that myosin light chain and the limb kinase acts not only on the stroma, but we know that this drug was initially brought out to act in glaucoma. So it has a lot of uh, uh, action on the actomyosin contractility, uh, membrane permeability, cellular adhesions, cell stiffening, cell morphological changes, extracellular matrix organization, and DNA synthesis. And that has been found to be very effective in patients with glaucoma by uh, increasing the aqueous outflow. Now, a lot of the tests and the studies which have been done are done in the, in the lab on uh, corneal endothelial cells, on, uh, you know, in experiment uh, situations. And uh, we would always like to know how that translates into our clinical practice. So over time, uh, it has been shown by groups that it, ha it is known to regulate a number of functions in all corneal layers, including the cellular proliferation, differentiation, and modulation, and the cell addition, which we know are very important in our endothelial function. So uh, how is the application of this drug? It helps in increasing the proliferation, healing of the endothelium, um, slowing of the apoptosis, which we know is very integral to this disease, and increasing cell additions. So the medication that we are talking about is ripasudyl monohydrate, 0.4%, um, which we'll be studying. So as I was saying, there are a lot of uh, 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 papers which are available to us, but uh, many of them are in the lab situation. Of course, there are large groups which have shown it in uh, clinical practice as well. So the purpose of the study was to evaluate the effect and safety of these ripasudyl 0.4% drops on the clinical indices, which we see on slit lamp and the patient's symptomatology. Um, and the questions which came up to me was that which stage of the disease does this work best? What kind of changes do we expect? How do we measure these changes? And um, there has been a lot of work uh, of these drops with um, uh, DSO, which is just the stripping of the decimates and it's shown to work well. Um, so can it over time replace a corneal transplant? So this was a prospective longitudinal study. We followed them up for one year, 20 eyes, and uh, we included um, relatively mild to moderate grades of FACD grade one to four by the Krashmer classification. Um, of course, these were patients of FACD. We did not include any other forms of endothelial disease, and we made sure that none of these patients had any pre-existing ocular disease which could confound our results or uh, contribute to their endothelial dysfunction. So apart from our uh, very detailed slit lamp evaluation to try and grade these uh, conditions, we know specular microscopy is our gold standard for studying the endothelium. We also checked the pachymetry because we know that they can have some amount of corneal edema. Uh, in addition, uh, we did a confocal microscopy to evaluate the endothelium more detailed and a tear collection to look for any biomarker change that might be there. And we longitudinally followed these patients up for one year. So coming to the results, um, it was very interesting to note that um, among 20 eyes, now here's where the challenge comes. Um, 14 of these, when we checked by their clinical features, that is their slit lamp examination, their vision, their uh, specular microscopy, they showed no progression. There was no drop in the endothelial cell count, we'll come to that, but clinically on their slit lamp, there was no progression uh, in 14. Four eyes showed a progression in spite of being on these drops. These were already in a grade four, and they progressed further, and of these, uh, they are requiring an endothelial keratoplasty to have undergone. Very interestingly, two patients showed a very uh, initial reduction in their early stromal edema, and we know that many of these patients complain of early morning uh, changes, you know, their vision gets blurred early morning when they wake, which improves over time, and they felt an improvement in their symptoms, which is a subjective uh, change. Uh, when we come to the diagnostics, there was uh, no drop, no significant drop in the endothelial density. Of course, we do not expect an improvement. Um, the pachymetry also remained almost the same, uh, which brings me to a very, uh, uh, another conundrum which we faced was that very often in these patients of folks, especially because the gutte and the confluent gutte are right in the center, um, the specular shows up like this where there's hardly any cells which are visible on the specular microscopy, and even if they show some numerical values, you don't know what to believe. So in cases like this, then how do we follow up these patients, and how do you assess whether they're getting uh, improved or not? So that is one point which I, I thought would be important. When we looked at the confocal microscopy as well, um, there are a number of changes which have been described in uh, these patients of Fuchs, uh, but there was no significant change over time, over one year, in these patients, um, uh, in either their cystic changes or the amount of scarring at the endothelial level. 
Um, we know that uh, there have been published uh, literature on what are the normal uh, molecular changes in FACD. Uh, we did find them to be significantly um, lower, uh, but there was no change, and, and that uh, is quite expected because these are uh, parameters which, uh, this is not the uh, pathway where uh, the rho kinase drops acts at all, so we do not expect any change. Uh, one very important thing, and I'm just concluding here, one very important thing is that many of these patients did complain of uh, irritation, and two of them had uh, intolerable redness and irritation which made them stop the drops, and two eyes showed these kind of epithelial cystic changes uh, which again made us stop the drops over time. So our questions at the beginning of the paper was what stage does it work best, and from um, our uh, current experience now, uh, probably it works early because in some at least there was a, a reduction in the edema. The changes would be a clinical improvement more than a specular change. Look out for their side effects which can be and uh, maybe not yet um, there to replace a corneal transplant. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. So how early, the moment you make a diagnosis of uh, uh, Fuchs, do you start them on uh, rho kinase inhibitors? Um, so right now, that's what I'm doing. I don't know if it's uh, right or wrong, or should we should wait for the clinical edema, and probably that's one of the questions which uh, you could answer. But the understanding is that probably it is the early edema only which is changing, because that is what has been described even in literature, that uh, there has been some reversal of the stromal edema in, in patients. We're not expecting a cellular change. So maybe, I don't know if it prevents it in any way. Does it do anything to the intraocular pressure in these patients? In those patients, there's no significant change. So I have been monitoring because it is an anti-glaucoma medication, yeah. but there's no significant uh, drop in their IOP as well because what that would be a problem. What dose did you use for? Uh, three times a day. So what has been described is either two, three, or four times. So I've used three times a day for all these patients. So typically in a patient who is asymptomatic but with Fuchs, would you still recommend rokinase? So for lack of anything else, yes. It's such a slowly progressing disease that we don't uh, know, it, you know, Many of these patients at one year, they may still have had the same features even if yeah. they had not started rokinase. We don't really know, but as of now, yes, I do start them even if they don't. If I find the gutte as, you know, visible gutte clinically, I would start. And uh, patients who are undergoing cataract surgery in, uh, in Fuchs, yes. will you advise so uh, use of uh, rokinase? So, uh, again, similar. Uh, I do tell them that they have a problem. If it's it's completely a pristine cornea except for those gutte, then I would probably see them immediately post-op. And uh, it has been described that if you start it early in the post-operative period, if there's little edema, it may hasten the clearance of the edema as well. So there are no hard and fast rules. Are there any studies of using, uh, I mean, this is hypothetical of using intracameral rokinase? Um, no, I, I've not come across anything like that. <laughs> that will come a new set of challenges to see. Would a diurnal um, corneal thickness help you? Uh, it, it probably would. It probably would. We know that there is a normal, I mean, early morning they are known to have yes, correct, a, yeah. edema. So, you so know that. yeah, uh, but uh, that would probably make sense One to of check. Things that yes. One more thing which has been described is uh, in patients who have very early changes, uh, topography, especially a pentacam, it picks up the difference in central versus peripheral uh, pachymetry and that could be used as a follow-up parameter correct. over time to see the progression because other parameters may not pick up the early change in packing. That's what we've tried to see. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sri Devi has come, so her flight was delayed. Okay, good. Okay. Because her flight was delayed. Do you want to start real quick? Yes. May I start? A very good morning to all of you. I'll be presenting our study on impact of taping the upper mask edge on ocular surface stability and dry eye symptoms. My co-authors are Professor Jeevan S. Tityal, Dr. Sri Devi Nair, and Dr. Ram Kishore Sa. Mm -hmm. There are no financial disclosures. So face masks, as we all know, have become the norm in the post-pandemic er era, and the widespread use is associated with mask-associated dry eye, with symptoms such as redness, discomfort, tearing, and foreign body sensation. And the long-term use of face masks mask has an adverse impact on the ocular surface parameters, especially in occupations such as ours that require prolonged use of 
face mask and patients with pre-existing dry eye also have an aggravation of symptoms. The poor fitting of the upper mask itch results in leakage of air towards the ocular surface which aggravates these symptoms. So the rationale of our study was to uh, study the impact of sealing the upper mask edge on the ocular surface stability and dry eye symptomatology amongst healthcare workers who regularly used N95 masks. It was a prospective interventional pre-post study conducted at Dr. RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences. The study population consisted of healthcare workers employed in a tertiary eye care center and written informed consent of course was obtained from all participants. A sample size calculation was performed using an effect size of 0.4 and for a power of study of 80%, a minimum of 49 participants were required. Only the right eye measurements were used for analysis. All consenting individuals above the age of 18 years without any pre-existing dry eye disease were included and any history of topical ocular medication used within the past three months or any comorbidities were an exclusion criteria. Contact lens users were also excluded. So the dry eye symptom score was assessed, visual acuity and ocular surface tests were performed. Pre-taping, the visual ocular surface parameters and symptom score were evaluated. At the end of an eight-hour shift during which the healthcare worker did not seal the upper edge of the mask. The post-taping assessment was performed after sealing the upper edge of N95 mask to the nasal bridge for an eight-hour shift. All participants used the same model of the mask. All measurements were taken between 5 to 6 p.m. in the same room, control temperature and humidity conditions. So the symptom score assessment was performed using OSDI and SANDE1 score pre and post intervention and SANDE2 score is only for post intervention. Non-invasive tests were performed at an intervening gap of five minutes, including the non-invasive tear breakup time, tear meniscus height, tear lipid layer thickness. Invasive tests were performed at an intervening gap of 15 minutes, including SHRMA1, corneal and conjunctival staining, and tear osmolarity. The primary outcome was a change in tear film stability assessed by a non-invasive tear breakup time. Secondary outcomes were change in symptom scores, lipid layer thickness, SHRMA1, ocular surface staining, tear meniscus height and osmolarity and uh, any change in uncorrected or corrected distance visual acuity. Statistical tests were performed as appropriate. And the mean age of the cohort was 26.7 plus minus 3.67 years. What we observed was a significant increase in non-invasive tear breakup time after taping. There was no significant change in the ocular surface disease index or the Sande 1 score. The mean Sande 2 score post taping was 9.89 plus minus 4.95. 68% participants reported a decrease in frequency and severity of symptom. Median score for change in frequency was minus 7 and for change in severity was minus 8, which indicated a decrease in severity and frequency of symptoms with taping. There was a significant increase in tear lipid layer thickness, tear meniscus height and a significant decrease in corneal staining score after taping the upper mask edge. There was a significant decrease in tear osmolarity. No change in SHRMA1 score was observed and the conjunctival staining score was also not significant. No significant change in uncorrected or corrected distance visual acuity. A correlation analysis was performed of the ocular surface parameters with the subjective Sande 2 score and the change in lipid layer thickness, non-invasive and tear breakup, invasive tear breakup time and the uh, tear meniscus height positively correlated with the change in symptom frequency and duration in the Sande 2 score with a significant p-value. There was no correlation with conjunctival or corneal staining and SHRMA 1 with the Sande 2 score. So just to summarize, the significant increase in non-invasive breakup time, tear breakup time, lipid layer thickness and tear meniscus height and a significant decrease in corneal staining score and tear osmolarity was observed after taping the mask. 68% subjects reported an improvement in symptom severity and frequency after taping the upper mask edge and this change in ocular surface parameters showed a significant correlation with the standard 2 score. The primary mechanism for mask associated dry eye is the mechanical desiccation of the ocular surface caused by an inadvertent airflow towards the eye and the steady flow of warm exhaled hair has an adverse impact on the tear film homeostasis and causes increased evaporation. Risks of increased dry eye in patients undergoing mechanical ventilation and CPAP mask is also a similar mechanism. So this leads to a vicious cycle of increased dry eye related symptoms, inflammation and tear hyperosmolarity evaporation. 
So sealing the upper mask edge leads to a definite improvement in ocular surface parameters and dry eye symptoms and treatments regarding the augmentation of lipid layer thickness may be considered in mask associated dry eye patients. Thank you. So this is done only for a period of 8 hours? The pre and post intervention after 8 hours with or without taping. Yes sir. There's a lot of work also being done on taping so that the microbiome of the ocular surface doesn't change yes, due to the expired air that is uh, yes, comes up from your nasopharynx which typically has a different uh, uh, bacterial yes, uh, and I mean different agents inside uh, compared to our skin, nose, eyes. So everything is quite uh, delicately balanced. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank With this, we end the session. Thank you. Which one? We don't have you here. We don't have it here. We don't have it on the list here. Can you just show it to us on this? Or no? No, show it to us on this. this yeah. That was from our EBCRC. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So we had given them this cryopreserved form. Hello. Okay, yeah. Doctor. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm here to present my work on the cryopreserved donor corneal tissue, first time used in India for therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty during COVID-19 pandemic. So 2020, there were strict lockdown, restrictions and restriction, even restriction of eye retrieval, we could not do eye retrieval. For large perforated corneas, patient has literally lost their eyes because of unavailability of the cornea. So that time question came in my mind for smaller perforation you have multiple options but what about the larger perforation? Are there any other corneas? Yes, there are option of cryopreserved corneas. So my is, is, is the case series of nine patients, 10 grafts are done, one eye repeat TPK was done, eight patients fungal corneal infiltrate, one patient pseudocornea, he was severe neglected case of peripheral ulcerative keratitis. Procedure is unused cornea, only unused cornea on completion of their expiry date are transferred under the lamellar flow hood. Temperature is minus 80 degrees Celsius, special freezer is used. It allowed indefinite preservation and it is only and only available with EBCRC Mumbai, no personal or financial interest. Travel time to mention here, we did face uh, many restrictions in transport, even a milk van, patients relative went, our staff went in the red zone of COVID. Tra travel time was 24 to 36 hours, but maintain the cold chain. The surgical procedure was used as routine for the therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. This is the cryopreserved cornea, yes. It did has more DM folds, more stromal edema, more epithelial defects compared to the usual therapeutic graft. You have to just remove this graft from the vial and you can directly use it. The surgical procedure, five eyes, large graft of 12 mm, four eyes, graft size of 7.5 to 9.5. This is 7.5 graft. Interrupted sutures, 8.0 for more than 11 mm. All the rims were sent for bacterial and fungal culture to know how safe is the cryopreserved cornea. All the post-operative routine for therapeutic cornea, uh, therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty was followed. Follow-up range from 5 to 12 months. So the results are persistent epithelial defects were there. It healed over a period of one month in five eyes, two to three months in two eyes. Recurrence of infection, yes, four eyes out of nine. One eye required repeat TPK, three eyes we managed successfully with the medical. None of them went into the endophthalmitis. And to begin with, we had larger fulminant ulcer to start with. This is the patient with persistent epithelial defect at one month. We advised amniotic membrane transplant, he didn't underwent. So three months it was completely epithelized. This is the patient with repeat TPK, first step post-op, again recurrence, we did one more TPK, but we could not save his eyes, he underwent into the prethysis. This is one more patient, first patient with the severe P PUK, neglected patient, never worried for the follow-up. These are the four patients with recurrence. 
all the donor rim were sent for the culture only one rim grew the aspergillus the same patient has recurrence twice but the second month uh, recurrence cannot be related to the first infection so cryopreserve is a very age old method ebcrc used the technique described by mosgan atal techniques there are different techniques also but all studies support inconsistent viability of endothelial cells so you can use it only and only for therapeutic purpose first time clinical use was done by onel p atal for therapeutic pkp there is a larger case series of 45 eyes 39 eyes they could save it without recurrence maintain the anatomical integrity but to note here their infections were smaller in size and average duration means the day from where you have started the cryopreservation till the date it was used surgically it was 9.5 in their case series and we our eyes were more than 1 year old and there are been reports of dal been done with this cryopreserved corneas so in short 10 cryopreserved cornea we used successful eradication in four eyes in first attempt there are recurrence but we managed successfully to begin with large ulcers we have as a usual in our indian scenario larger graft size longer duration of cryopreservation we could achieve anatomical integrity in seven eyes and we did face major major transport issues there are so many people involved for the success of this case series and to conclude just that do not forget the option of cryopreserved cornea there are glycerol cornea also but when you don't give it even a normal therapeutic corneas mainly in the peripheral centers you can always keep uh, in your uh, mind that there are cryopreserved cornea which can be used for the maintaining anatomical integrity thank you thank you i think then we'll uh, end the session thank you thank you thank you already short of time so congratulations to all of you for having done really good work and we were very happy to judge as always it's always a close call as to who will be the winner but all of you were excellent thank you thank you thank you so